Most of our listeners first came to know the sexy, silky, smooth sound of David Michael on episode 71 when he came on to discuss his show, My Book of Mormon. His ambitiously masochistic goal was to pick his way through Joseph Smith's magnum opus whilst lending the text his own brand of critical witticisms. So now, after more than a year of drudgery, David has put that quest in the rearview mirror and joins us to celebrate. David, welcome back to the show. Well, thank you for having me back, Noah. So now, first of all, I should congratulate you not just on finishing the Book of Mormon, but also for joining Eli and Adam Reeks in the coveted Five Timers Club. So there's wow. a little something to add to the resume. You didn't know it had been that many times, did you? I, I suppose you're counting the uh, Farnsworth quotes. Yeah, I, I have to to get you there. Yeah, yeah. I there know. you go. I'll take it. I'll take it. All right. So uh, now just because you're done with the Book of Mormon, that doesn't mean you're going off the air, correct? No, apparently uh, I didn't know this when I started. Had I known, I might, maybe wouldn't have started. But yeah, this was only the first of their books. They yeah. have they have more after this. They've got I'm like afraid. a whole trilogy, don't they? Yeah, it seems that way. Uh, thank goodness they they consider the King James Bible a part of their uh, canon. But thank goodness for Thomas, who's already tackling that one for us, because mm. I, I I wouldn't want to have to do that one too. But yeah, next up is something called the Pearl of Great Price. So uh, that sounds fun. And then uh, after that, we have the Doctrines and Covenants. So, oh, okay, so you know. now the Pearl of Great Price, that was just basically Joseph Smith going back and saying, oh, you know what else I meant to say? Is, is that correct? It's I don't. So the joy, what everybody likes about the show is that I haven't the foggiest idea what I'm about to read. So uh, oh, right yeah, I really don't know. Uh, I'll tell you, and I, I will probably get into it, but there's there's got to be more, because I was surprised more than anything on what the Book of Mormon didn't say, more than more than what it did. Nothing about the magic underwear in there, was there? Not a lick, no. Yeah, well, you know. Uh, well, uh, now, I, I, I hesitate to ask this question because I don't want to spoil anything, but with the Doctrines and Covenants, as I understand it, there's a lot of contention over, like, like each sect of Mormonism or whatever has their own version of that book. So have you looked into that at all, like which one you're going to use for your uh, reading? Yeah, so the I, th I guess the only thing that all anyone that calls themselves a Mormon agrees on is the Book of Mormon. That that, mm. that was a real thing. Everything after that is where things starting to get a little fuzzy. So I have uh, looked into church history some. I kind of felt like that wasn't spoiling anything in the in the readings. And uh, so, you know, Joseph did a pretty good job. Ex Joseph Smith, to everyone that doesn't know who I'm referring to, uh, did, a, did a good job of convincing everyone that he found these plates and translated them. And great. And a lot of people accepted that and said, okay, cool. Thanks for the uh, translation. But then he kept talking, and uh, some people said, "Why is the translator still talking? I don't, I don't know why mm -hmm. <laughs> the tra the translator's still going on and on." And so some people kept listening, and and some didn't. I think that's, I think that's that's where everything started to go go astray. Okay, all right. So it'll be interesting to learn a little bit more about that as you go. Now, you were kind enough to to agree to join us for something of a book report. But before we get started on that, I, I did want to ask you about something else because we had a little fun picking at each other during the podcast award votings. And among the many things that I made fun of about you was an award that you won that just so happened to share a name with the Good Sportsmanship Consolation Prize for Women's Curling in Canada, which is also a very prestigious award, I'm sure. But when I started looking into it, I found out is that's like a Mormon award for best scriptural discussion of some sort. <laughs> Apparently it is. Yeah, so the... Uh... There's quite a bit happening on, on from the inside of the LDS Church recently. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's there was a movement called Ordain Women, started by this woman named Kate Kelly, where it's basically attacking the the blatant misogyny within the Latter Day Saints. Uh, she was excommunicated for her efforts. There right. is somebody else named John Delin who has a podcast called Mormon Stories. So and these are all Mormons, right? Th these aren't you know apostates, mm -hmm. and so. Uh, and so he started kind of challenging a lot of the, you know, just common sense questions about their doctrine. And he's actually been on the air for 10 years doing that and recently got uh, excommunicated himself. And so even within the Mormon movement, there does seem to be this intellectual curiosity, which I think was birthed primarily by the Internet. Right. right. It was pretty easy to keep uh, all of these, you know, just, oh, I don't know, bad facts about their history hidden from their uh, congregation until it was just available to everyone. And so it's uh, it's pretty interesting how how many believing Mormons listen to my show like that. That shocked me from the beginning. And even even today, I still get emails from some. There's actually been a few people that have have written in to say that the show kind of completely deconverted them, which was uh, great to hear, even though it was never my mission to do that. Kind mm -hmm. of cool. Right. And um, but, yeah, the John DeLynn, I actually have recently partnered with. And it, it was interesting. I never thought that I would take a show with, you know, being hosted by a very 
self-proclaimed atheist, never hid that from anyone, yeah. reading this their holy scripture and saying what I think of it, and that I would end up partnering with someone that still calls himself a Mormon. He, I was going to say, you say he's not an apostate. I think the Mormon church would differ with you on that a bit. Uh, yeah, they did kick his ass out. He's gone. They said, uh, yeah, they had a nice little trial for him and said, get the fuck out. Uh -huh. uh, so, yeah, he's he's still – it's it's tough to wrap your head around, like, do you actually believe this? Or is this kind of like you just like the cultural identity of it? So I'm, that's still a little unclear. But what I like about him, I, I tend to judge people more for their actions. You can, you can think whatever you want. It doesn't really bother me. Mm -hmm. And so he's doing real good work. I mean, he's uh, started something called the Open Stories Foundation, which uh, helps people with mental health issues as they're kind of, you know, trying to figure out their faith identity issues and, and sexual identity type issues. And so, uh, as I probably mentioned the last time I was on the show, started something called the Taylor Scholarship, which is a, a scholarship for people that need that type of help but, but can't afford it. Mm -hmm. And so the scholarship pays for it. And so a lot of the uh, show's donations, actually the majority of the show's donations go into that. And so we actually just recently partnered with him to uh, to kind of use that network that he's created of therapists around the country that are deal with these issues specifically. Excellent. On uh, so yeah, it was uh, sometimes it's it's reaching across the aisle, I guess, if you want to call it that, is a good thing when you have evidence that they're doing good work, right? And so uh, yeah, I don't know what what's keeping him from from taking the next step to say, yeah, this is all just bullshit. Well, but that's probably a good thing that someone who has that legitimacy is trying to fix it from the inside. At least, yeah. you know, maybe he is going to throw in the towel eventually, but I'm glad to see him doing it. No, I agree. And and that's, that's that's you know, the point that I'm trying to make is that if if someone is doing the good work, right, that, that something to actually help their community around them, then, yeah, I don't I really don't care what you believe. I, I would I would much prefer that over someone that talks the talk and doesn't walk the walk. Right. So. Uh, so, yeah, I'm pretty happy about that. What was Excellent. the original question? We lost track of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, I, I do want to ask, because I think this is the most important question, if our listeners want to get involved in this Taylor Scholarship, how do they do that? Oh, well, you can go to the show's website at uh, mybookofmormonpodcast.com. You'll see links for it on the right side. Uh, you can just click right there. Excellent. And, uh, yeah, it'll take you to the to the PayPal site to, to contribute directly. Awesome. And, of course, we'll have that linked on the show notes for this episode as well. So l let's talk a little bit more about the Book of Mormon itself. I guess you already sort of answered my first question, which is, whether you were at any point converted by the perfection of God's holy word as revealed to Joseph Smith. So you're, you're not a Mormon now? I don't know that you asked me that, but there was a very, the, the very end of the book, and I'm talking like, I think maybe the second to last sentence of the book, is something that's called the Moroni Promise. And uh, there's this promise that's given by this guy Moroni, who says that as long as you've read this whole thing, and you pray diligently, then God will reveal that it's true to you, right? So uh, I did my best, did it, did it on the air, and uh, I did my best to be, I don't know, sincere about it. Like mm -hmm. I, I told God, I was like, now God, you've you've got quite a mountain to climb here. So if you're going to show me something, it's going to be you're going to have to knock me out of my chair because, <laughs> wow, there's going to be uh, quite a bit to overcome. But yeah, he didn't even he didn't even show up. So we had to end the show early. I told everybody we we had an interview with God scheduled, and he he just didn't make it. So yeah, yeah. I know how that is. Now, would you say that like actually reading the book has changed? I mean, I know you didn't know really anything about Mormonism going in, but has it changed your attitudes about the religion? Yeah, quite a bit. What what's so bizarre about it is that I've you know since starting the show, I've learned a lot about Mormonism and Mormons in particular. It, it really is a, an entire subculture especially of America. I don't know what it, as much about what it's like around the rest of the world, but it's a whole, I mean, they speak a different language. I've come to been told it's called Mormonese is what they all jokingly call it. Mm -hmm. It's just a very different community and they, they have all these different traditions and they, you know, they have this prophet they listen to and all this kind of stuff. None of that is in the book. The, the book of Mormon really does sound like just some lost chapters of the old Testament that happened to be in America. So yeah, okay, you have to get over that part. Right, right. But, but otherwise, it's not that different. They, they do uh, do quite a bit of lambasting against the Catholic Church. So there's like this whole large section about how awful it is to baptize infants and you should wait till someone can make their own decision and this kind of thing. So it was clearly an attack against Catholicism. Mm -hmm. But other than that, it, it just, I, and I actually said this at the end, I said, even if I got the, the vision from God at the end that said, yes, this is all true, I don't know that that makes me a Mormon. It would just kind of make me a Protestant, I think. Right. right? It, it just didn't really, I mean, there were even sections in there that talked about how bad polygamy was. And that, it's like, what what's going on? What, where's the Mormon stuff, right? 
So I'm still confused, and and I know that this is going to come to light next, right? Right. Yeah. Um, for sure. It's in but the, it's, uh, but it's yeah, post-script. very very confusing that this is their their lead in book to everyone. And maybe maybe because it is so familiar. If you're going to try and convert a Christian, give them something that they're used to reading, mm-hmm. and say, see, this is all true. But but again, yeah, I, I if I was even if I was one of those people in the 1830s that that believed that Joseph Smith found the plates and translated them, I I would thank him and say, okay, you're done now, you did your work for God and you can shut up. <laughs> I don't really care what else you have to say. You were just a translator. So yeah, that that to me was the most surprising thing about the Book of Mormon was was that how how little it had to say about uh you know the way that Mormons practice their faith today. Yeah, right, right. Well, I mean, if you look at, at, say, Catholicism and then read the New Testament, I'm sure you would feel the exact same way, you know, if you were more familiar with religion before you were familiar with their with their holy books. So now tell us about some, like, of the the wackiest crap that you came across, maybe some uh, fun stuff that we that the average person doesn't know is in there. All right. Well, like I said, the uh, there's actually two stories in the book about people coming from Israel to America. I don't know if you knew this. No, it happened twice in the book. Hmm. So the, the first time it happened, which I say first, even though it's one of the last chapters of the book, but chronologically, uh, right after the Tower of Babel, which I'm sure you remember, apparently there was a lost chapter because God decided to bless one family at the Tower of Babel and uh, and didn't mess up their language. I still don't know how that helps them right. because everybody else speaks a different <laughs> language, but whatever, their language was good. And, uh, but they had to, they had to, God promised them this promised land and he told them they could have the promised land as long as they always, you know, kind of swore to it that they would always serve him and love him. They could have it. And so in order to get there, he, uh, instructed them how to build. And I'm not, I'm not joking about this at all. Submarines. So <laughs> what? yeah, this happens in, yeah. Read it. The Book of Ether is the name of this story. In the, I bet the it is. Yeah, that's probably and, uh, what inspired yeah. it. So, and, and the best part is they, they build these things, just like God says, and they said they were tight as a dish and no water could penetrate them. And then the uh, the the you know the hero of this story says to God, hey, God, I noticed something. It's going to be a problem. We can't breathe in there. And, uh-huh. and God's like, oh, right. Hadn't thought of that. <laughs> My bad. And so he says, just, just you know, Cut a little hole in the top and stick a cork in it, and then uh, when you're out there, sometimes you'll be above the water, and so just just pull the cork out. If there's no, if there's water coming in, you know, pop it back in. If there's no water, well then you get some air. And I was just like, what is it? What the what the fuck are they talking about? And then it gets better, right? And then they were complaining that there was no light in it, uh-huh. and God's like, well, I can't help you there. What do you want a window? Come on. And so uh, so then the, the the guy actually has to say to God like well how about I like take some rocks and and I'll hold them up in the air and can you just like touch your finger to them and light them up and God's like well I suppose I could so he does that for him it, seriously all God doesn't have any of these ideas these are the people coming up with them so now they have light in there so they load these submarines I think there was I think there was 18 of them or something they load them with all their livestock and enough provisions for the journey and it takes them almost a year i think it was 344 days or something to get across the ocean wow in a, in a in a sealed container with a little air hole in the top i mean just the logistics and all the of animals that. and yeah. shitting all over the place uh-huh. you're over and they talk about the, the way they got there was god like made these giant storms to push the boats along mm-hmm. i guess cuz he didn't god didn't know about sails what underwater storms it's very confusing. I think it was the, the, the storms were so strong that sometimes they would go underwater and then they just kind of bounce back up. Oh, I got it's you. this kind of a thing. Yeah. So it was kind of a like bobbing a rubber motion across the ocean. A, okay. Yeah. With the, you know, with a closed container full of animal excrement and <laughs> right. splashing around everywhere. Yeah. It must have just been fabulous. Why haven't yeah. they made a movie about this? That one, that one shocked me. I was, uh, as I was reading, because it doesn't say the word submarine, right? It's just mm-hmm. talking about these vessels. And it, they were tight like a dish, and I'm going, what, what, what? are they talking? No, they can't possibly be. And then all of a sudden, it was like, yes, we had to make them so that we could go down and be with the whales. I was like, fuck me, that really are submarines. So yeah, that was uh, that was pretty. That was a fun one. Wow. Yeah. So there can't possibly be anything wackier than the submarines, can there? That that one, yeah, I think that one's got to be the best. I mean, there's definitely some fun characters in the book, you know. And and I'm trying to remember what I told you last time I was on, but there's this one guy named Ammon. Who uh, he's like this missionary, and he's a badass missionary because uh, when people didn't, when he disagreed with them, he just killed them, right? I mean, well, there was some people that were that were messing with him. Well, some that uh, he just chopped their arms off and didn't kill, 
And then he like dragged all the arms back to the king to show what a good person he was. So and that guy was he was nuts. Uh, so he was he was a fun character. There's another guy named Captain Moroni who uh, was a terrible terrible battle commander. Like at, while he's out there, he just it takes him several chapters throughout the book to figure out that when you're attacking a fortified city, you should lay siege to it. He just he could not figure that out. He would send wave after wave, and they'd all get killed. And then finally he figured out, now hold on, I have a brilliant idea. And I was like, yeah, you're the first person in history right. who figured this out. <laughs> you're a genius. But anyway, so yeah, there was, there was definitely parts that were, that were entertaining, kept the story going. Uh, but yeah, I think the submarines definitely have to take the cake for the nuttiest thing. Either that or the magic brass ball. But, but wait, I don't wait. Time for that. Oh well, uh, you're, that's just look, kind of your way of making sure that I invite you on for a sixth time, so you can beat <laughs> oh, Adam Reese, right? So they're wandering around the wilderness. They don't know where to go, and uh, this guy walks out of his tent, and there's a there's a brass ball just sitting on the ground, and apparently God gave it to him, and so it has these little needles on it, and it points the the way that they need to go, and if they want food, it'll point them to where the food is, and if they want, it just points. And it'll put little messages on there, but it only works if you have faith. So it's kind of like this magic faith compass. And, uh, yeah, that's 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 a thing that, that God gave them. And that was just Seems fabulous. like that would be more useful than the underwear, if, if, they could, if they could have had one or the other. I don't know. The underwear's supposed to be bulletproof, so... That's true. Hmm, depends on the circumstances, I think. <laughs> now, I, I guess there's a lot of ways that I could ask this last question of you, but I think the best way is with a little echo added in post-production. So when it comes to the Book of Mormon... How, How bullshit, bullshit is, is it? it? Wow, on a scale of 1 to 10? Whatever scale you prefer, sir. <laughs> All right, I think, uh, man. All right, uh, this is going to be a long answer, but I couldn't find anything credible in it, and I really tried. This book, even if you read it at, at its, you know, take it at its own claims, mm -hmm. is supposed to be a bunch of ancient plates that, the, by the way, these were not the plates Joseph found. These were plates that their guy named Mormon abridged and then made new plates. I see. And those are the ones that Joseph found and then translated. So it's, uh, and even actually there was some other abridging that happened too, even before that. So you have these plates from all over the place, from dubious sources, that some other guy that we don't really know decides to abridge them. So we don't have that original text. Then you get the plates that they get buried. Joseph Smith finds them, then he translates them. Then they disappear. And now they're gone. Mm -hmm. It's just everything about it is just so, I don't know, there's just, you cannot find any, any shred of historical credibility throughout it. And so, yeah, that was, that was pretty tough. And then, of course, submarines and uh, yeah, right. times, that's also kind of weird. So, yeah, yeah, I think it's, uh I think it's, I would say complete bullshit. No, that's, that's the way I would answer. Complete. Sounds to me like even if you give it, like, a lot of credit, it's still bullshit. So, uh, that, that says an awful lot. And I hope listeners will uh, appreciate that I really tried to give it the benefit of the doubt, but in the end, it is complete bullshit. Well, you know what? They can find out for themselves, obviously. It's all on record. So if you were waiting to check out David's show to make sure he wasn't going to puss out halfway or anything, you can get started now by checking out the link to my Book of Mormon on the show notes for this episode. Or, of course, you can find it on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you found this one. Uh, now, can we get a commitment from you tonight that you'll be back on Post Doctrines and Covenants and Pearl of Great Bryce to let us know how those one, ones went? Absolutely, but you will. I will not come alone because uh, for the pearl, or for the doctrines and covenants, it sounded so boring. Just a bunch of bullet points about revelations Joseph was having. That I actually have decided to co-host that portion of the show with Bryce Blankenagle of the Naked Mormonism podcast. I believe you might have actually met Bryce out at a uh, recent con. Yes, I did. Awesome. So he's going to do that with me. So as I'm as I'm reading it and getting my knee jerk, what the fuck was that reaction? He'll actually be able to give us the historical context of it. So He'll actually have that somebody be... that speaks Mormony is right there on set. That's excellent. Exactly. So yeah, I tell you what. When I come back, I'll come back with Bryce and we'll give you a full recap. Sounds great, man. Thanks again for your time and good luck going forward. Thank you, Noah, and good luck to you too.